Hi, I'm Ashish Dhawan. I was the founder uh, and ran Chris Capital, one of India's first private equity funds, uh, which got started back in 1999. I left the corporate world, the private equity world, in 2012. Uh, and for the last nine years, I've been focused full-time on phil philanthropic work. Um, I initially started in education. So I'm a founder of Ashoka University. I still continue to chair the board. I'm actively involved. So when I look back, I mean, my philosophy has really been in philanthropic work very similar to that of an investor, which is that I want to see return on my capital. I want to see impact. I want to see scale. I want to see sustainability. And second, I want return on effort. I want to be really focused on the things that really matter uh, and to work on things that are important for the country. So I am very excited about the ACT platform. I've been speaking with Mohit for the last two, three years and really enthused that in the midst of the COVID crisis, this all came together. I'm a big believer that India has a unique entrepreneurial ecosystem, VC ecosystem, really smart people, people who understand how to build enterprises, who understand how to solve problems, and who I believe have a social conscience. And so whilst the first fund was launched last year as a rapid response to COVID uh, with 100 crore, now uh, the ACT platform is diversifying and education, environment, a number of funds. Um, I'm helping uh, along with Mohit and Makin pull together the education fund and uh, I'm very excited about us to the opportunity for all of us to work together to catalyze change. In the case of education, we want to work on ed tech and specifically look at foundational learning, which are the early years, which is most important for India, and the school to work transition. This is a unique moment uh, for that. And uh, so I would urge everyone, you know, to take a look at ACT seriously. Uh, I would urge you to get involved. This is the moment when India needs you. We are going through our development journey, and I think it's imperative that all of us give more, give faster, and give better. So ACT has now pulled together the EdTech Ambition Fund. Uh, this is something that's been in the making for the last few months. Uh, and Mohit Bhatnagar, uh, Mekin Maheshwari, and I have come together to help anchor this fund. And we're blessed that even though we've just gotten started and we've announced the ambition to create a 100 crore fund, philanthropic, to make grants, uh, we already have about half of that raised and about 20 people who have committed uh, capital. So we are already on our journey in terms of getting this started. What is the idea behind this fund? Well, I think as many of you know, EdTech is already starting to make a difference. Uh, there are several of you who have invested in companies or are founders of companies or know of companies that are making a difference, um, that have really taken off, particularly during these COVID times. What we saw in addition to what was happening in India One, which is the top 10% of the socioeconomic pyramid, um, which these companies address, is that everybody actually got used to learning through a smartphone. If you think about the children in government schools, uh, they didn't have Zoom classes, but their parents were receiving daily lessons that they would uh, work with their children on and uh, respond back, whether it's a worksheet, watch a video, etc. I'd like to introduce Karthik Mulidharan. Karthik is a friend and a genius. Uh, he was a Harvard undergrad, Harvard PhD, currently a professor at UC San Diego, has been working on India, has all his research is around India over the last 20 plus years. And Karthik has worked closely on education uh, for 10 plus years. He leads the JPAL, uh, which is the JPAL MIT initiative, uh, Abhijit Anestha, who got the Nobel Prize. Karthik leads the education vertical there. And uh, he's done numerous studies around education in India and globally, and has written sort of white papers, policy papers, on how we can reform education in India. So I couldn't think of anyone better than Karthik to come here and talk to us about the education landscape 
and the opportunities for us to work together to reform school education in India. So welcome, Karthik. So thank you so much for this invitation, and it's a pleasure to meet you all virtually. Uh, in the 20 minutes I have, I'm just going to first start with a very quick overview of where we are in education as a country, right? So I think the, one, the, the main good news over the past 20 years is we have had considerable success in school enrollment and getting kids into school. But the glass half empty side of that story is that increase in enrollment has not translated into improved learning outcomes. So as per most recent estimates, almost 50% of grade two ch of grade five children across uh, rural India are not able to read at even a second grade level. Okay. So, um, and this is a learning crisis. Uh, and the bad news is that the default approach we have to solving these problems is to spend more money. Okay. So, uh, and that's what typically education sector activists are looking for. But what we've seen is that the large increases in spending uh, and including the right to education have almost, you know, don't seem to have helped improve learning outcomes. And in fact, some components may have even hurt. Okay. So the business as usual is not working. Mm. And we need to fix this. Now, at the same time, it's also very, very clear that improving school learning outcomes is the most essential foundational investment we'll make for the future of the country, both in terms of inclusion and in terms of growth. So um, if, to the extent that inclusive growth is what we aspire to as a country, the growth is going to depend on having adequate skills uh, so that you can actually power the kind of um, the, the kind of jobs that will allow us to grow faster. And on the inclusion side, you want people to be able to participate in the broader growth process. So I think the overall story, and in fact, if you look at the structure of the Indian economy, it very much reflects the historical pattern of the investments in education we've made, right? We've always focused on tertiary education, built IITs, built world-class institutions, but neglected primary education, neglected the base, at least for the first 30, 40 years after independence. And you kind of see that reflected in the structure of the Indian economy, which is we do very well in skill intensive manufacturing that demands high skill labor, um, you know, whether it's IT, whether it's pharmaceuticals, or even, even skill intensive automotive manufacturing. But where we've kind of missed the bus is the low skill labor intensive sectors that employ the hundreds of thousands of people that get you out of poverty the way you know China and increasingly Vietnam and even Bangladesh are doing okay so um, so building kind of these foundational skills is going to be central to allowing people to participate in the broader growth process now the one other thing we're seeing in the data, of course is a large scale exit to private schools uh, and now at one level this is maybe a slight improvement, but what the data suggests is that the private schools in their current form are also not a panacea. And what the real problem is, regardless of public or private, we have fundamental problems in pedagogy, which is what I'll come and explain in a moment. Okay. So we really are at a moment of crisis and this lack of skills and employability, you know, risk the demographic dividend. I've been saying this for 15 years could become a demographic disaster. That disaster is already, I think, knocking on our doorsteps. Now, fortunately, we've got the new education policy that finally recognizes the centrality of this problem and talks about foundational literacy and numeracy. Uh, but we still have a long way to go. So I think the... The, the other key points, and I'm not going to have time to cover all of this. And, you know, for those of you interested, I recommend a long recent podcast I did for over three hours where I summarize about 20 years of research and policy in education. But I think the business as usual patterns of spending, we spend on infrastructure, we spend on teacher salaries. I'm talking about public schools. Um, we spend on, you know, teacher training, we spend on school inputs for the most part, does not seem to be having much of an impact on learning outcomes. And uh, now that's very depressing because that's 95% of what we spend our time on. But the good news is that we also now have robust evidence on two classes of interventions that seem to work in a very systematic way. Uh, the first is just improvement in governance. Um, and the governance includes, you know, everything from improving teacher attendance to improving teacher motivation to improving the visibility you have on actual child effort and learning outcomes. Okay, so we have a series of studies just showing that better governance and monitoring and supervision helps improve outcomes in a low cost, cost effective way. But the other big issue is, and this is almost the most important thing I want to focus on, which is that our textbooks and syllabi were written for a time when you essentially only the top half of the population was attending school. So what you've had in the past two decades or three decades is essentially tens of millions of first generation learners coming into school who don't have the support at home to allow them to keep pace with the, how the curriculum is doing. 
And so what happens is that these children get left behind very, very fast. And once you're left behind, even if you're attending school, you learn very little. And that's because you're so far behind that the textbook based instruction is not making that much sense. Okay. I'm going to show you just this one picture, which I, uh, which I, and I consider this perhaps the most important picture to understand Indian education today. Okay. Uh, and so this is based on a large sample of children in Rajasthan, where we have a long term ongoing study, but we get similar patterns in our data in Delhi, in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, and so this is a pretty broad phenomenon. So what is this picture showing us? Okay, so look at the left hand side on math and the x axis of this picture is what is the grade the child is enrolled in and the y axis is what is the assessed level of student learning. Okay, now basically if you're making pace at the rate of the curriculum, you would be on that 45 degree line. So if you're in the eighth standard, you would be at an eighth standard level. So the first key fact you see here is that the average level of learning is in fact given by the red line and not the blue line. And so the average rate of progress that kids are making in the public schooling system is about 50% of what the curriculum expects them to do. So, which means by the time you get to eighth standard, the average child is four grade levels behind, okay? Mm. So that gives you a sense of how big this gap is. But the second most important thing from this picture is each dot represents about 10 kids, okay? And so look at the variation you see within a given class, okay? So if you look at this eighth standard, uh, on the x axis, look at, uh, you know, seventh or eighth standard. And you'll see that in that eighth standard class, you have kids at a second grade level, a third grade level, a fourth grade level, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh and an eighth. Okay, so that is the kind of variation of student learning level sitting inside the same classroom. And mm, this a big part of this is, of course, because of the no detention policy that children have been kind of promoted without having prior grade level competences. But it, there's a deeper problem here, right? Because even if you're a highly motivated teacher, it's almost impossible to handle that kind of variation within a classroom. OK, so what does the teacher do? The teacher basically defaults into completing the textbook and the curriculum because that's kind of, you know, that's the exam and it's the exam is the tail that's wagging the dog of the curriculum and the pedagogy inside the classroom. Okay, so and this is in, in, in fact, it highlights the power of ed tech from just a measurement perspective because this graph is drawn from the MindSpark platform and the diagnostic assessment that allows us to pinpoint exactly at what level of learning a specific child is. Okay. And the one very robust set of uh, research results we have in the past 15 years is the power of what Pratham has pioneered, the idea of what's called teaching at the right level, which is instead of focusing on the textbook, you identify where the child is and you do instruction, you, 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 try, you, you provide content in a way that makes sense for the child at his or her current level. Okay. And this is now being tested in multiple high quality randomized control trials. And it's partly what won the Nobel Prize for uh, Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo and, and Michael Kramer. Uh, of course, they've done RCTs more broadly, but the work in education has been a big part of that portfolio of work. Okay, so mm, so the, so the deeper, the deep, the deepest source of crisis in Indian education is, is this learning crisis that tens of millions of children in the school system are so far behind that and now it makes sense as to why your business as usual spending doesn't seem to matter, right? If I build another classroom, mm, so Michael Kramer had this very uh, nice study in Kenya where they gave kids free textbooks, okay? And what they did in this randomized control trial was they tested the effectiveness of the free textbooks. And most of us would think the textbooks matter. But what they found was that this had no impact whatsoever. But then it was a bit more nuanced, which is they found that the top 20% of the kids in the baseline score did significantly better with the textbooks. But the average student did not benefit. That's because the average student couldn't read, okay? And so it, and this is obvious exposed, but ex ante, most of our education spending thinks about what are the inputs we are providing, right? So it's almost like our ministries are not ministries of education, but ministries of educational logistics, okay? So they mainly focus on providing the inputs, but what's happening inside the classroom is that the children are so far behind that most of this is not making, having any impact. So. I think, therefore, as a country, I would say the single most important thing we need to do in the next five years, and again, the new education policy says this, is everything else does, nothing else matters other than making sure that every single child is, has foundational literacy and numeracy skills by the time they have completed class five, because it's that foundation that then allows you to build on and do whatever else you want. Okay, so 
I have other work looking at long term learning trajectories of students. And what you see is that essentially, once you go above a certain grade, the kids at the bottom third of the distribution kind of add very little value over the course of a year because they're already so far behind the curriculum. OK, so. Mm, so the question then is, how are we going to do this? Okay, it's one thing to know that this needs to happen. It's another thing to say, how do we address this? Okay, um, and this is where I think the ed tech opportunity is mm, is 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 just. It, it, it's one of these big transformational moments, okay? And uh, conceptually, I think at Beck, everybody understands how many reasons why it could be such a great thing, okay? It allows you to get high quality content across all schools, unconstrained by the content knowledge of the teacher. It allows you to customize the instruction. It allows you to quicken the feedback loop between what a student does and what they learn. So, you know, normally if you do homework, it'll take three days for the teacher to correct and give it to you back. And by the time you see that you've got a question wrong, you've forgotten what you even did. Okay. Whereas here, when you do something and you get the instant feedback, that kind of sharply shortens the reinforcement loop for learning. And then, of course, the other great kind of potential with ed tech, which is especially relevant in COVID, is the ability to engage children in the household. OK, so uh, so historically, if you go look at, say, the Coleman report on education in the US in the 1960s, it kind of said that 60 to 80 percent of long term le education levels are determined by household factors and not by the school. Now, that was very depressing, right? Because as a policymaker, we think that we can influence the schools. We don't think we can influence the households. But now what the spread of mobile phones and particularly during COVID has allowed us to do is to potentially even reach people in the households. Okay. So, so the potential is enormous and which is why you have these, you know, Silicon Valley types talking about technology disrupting education, which is, which is in theory, absolutely right. The problem is when you go look at the data and when you go look at the high quality randomized evaluations on the effectiveness of ed tech, uh, the results are all over the place. Okay. So you've got some results with striking positive effects. You've got some studies that find zero effects, and then you've got some that find even negative effects. Okay. And so the, the main implication of this is that while tech has a lot of potential, getting to that potential will require an incredible amount of attention to detail and also constant measurement and evaluation, because often we don't even know what's going to work. OK, so to give you an example, this very high profile one laptop per child, you know, you had uh, Nick Negroponte and folks from the Media Lab back in the days, you know, evangelizing this as what was going to change education around the world. And governments often bought that and tried to kind of buy all of these laptops. Uh, and then you did this evaluation and found that there was zero impact. OK, there's another study of giving computers to middle school kids in Romania that found negative effects. And that's because they were all the kids were out playing games. OK, now. So basically, to get the benefits of ed tech, you're going to have to pay attention to how are you integrating the pedagogy with the technology. And rather than thinking about technology as the magic bullet, you need to think about what are the binding constraints to education and how is the technology alleviating that? So I think, for example, one of the reasons I think MindSpark and education initiatives have done such a good job is because they were not technologists coming to education. They were educators coming to technology. So they understood education really, really well. And then they were like, how do we use technology to alleviate some of these constraints that we face in, in, in the classroom? OK, now. So the, so the EdTech opportunity is very real and I'm delighted to kind of, you know, see this fund coming about because the problem we have is that mm, most of the innovation in this space, including MindSpark, right, is essentially catered to the top 10% of the distribution because that's where the paying customers are. OK, so uh, and, and traditionally, I think in our society, the way we have kind of bifurcated responsibility, it's almost like de facto, right, that the, that the elites have completely seceded from being in public schools. OK, so the private market, both in terms of the schools as well as the innovation, is catering to that top 10 or 20 percent of the population that is kind of your paying customers customers and we kind of leave the rest of the population essentially to the government. Okay. Now, the question, therefore, is how do you kind of leverage the work that's happening at the high end of the distribution to help catalyze a transformation across the country? Okay. And I think there's a very useful analogy here from Again, the work of Michael Kramer, who was my advisor, who just won the Nobel Prize, you know, last year in economics. But I think one of the 
one of the fundamental problems, okay, with the market. Markets are fantastic in terms of incentives for innovation and accountability innovation. You know, it's, it's an incredibly dynamic environment. The basic problem with the market is the market doesn't care for you if you don't have purchasing power, right? So the entire structure of the market is how do I deliver high quality products to people who can afford to pay? And so one way to think about the tension between democracy and markets is that the democratic ideal is one person, one vote. But as the market ideal is literally one dollar, one vote or one rupee, one vote, because the effort in the market is proportional to kind of where your paying customers are. OK, so the question, therefore, is that how do you get our larger public, our larger kind of society to reflect a little bit more of the democratic ideal of one person, one vote, as opposed to one dollar, one vote. Okay. Now, default, what we do is we say government will do this, but the government can't kind of execute at scale. Okay. Mm. So the challenge is how do you bring the energy of the private sector and kind of that accountability and dynamism and put that in the service of that bottom 60, 80% of the population. And so, you know, one of the simple, very insightful ideas that mm, that Michael had, say, in the context of vaccines. Okay, so the same thing applies to pharmaceutical research. Okay, so we'll spend billions and billions of dollars on kind of cures for late stage cancer that may help, like, you know, people at 85 live three months longer. But we massively under invest in kind of uh, tropical diseases or, you know, basically needs of needs in developing countries, uh, because there just isn't purchasing power around that. Okay, so the question here is, how do you take the dynamism of the market and channel that towards the needs of the poor. And so one of the ideas that Michael had in the context of vaccines was kind of creating uh, as part of Gavi, and of course, then supported by by BMGF and other major donors was to create this mm, what's called an advanced market commitment, where you essentially lay out a grand challenge to private innovators and say that if you come up with a vaccine for these neglected tropical diseases or a bunch of other, you know, um, what was identified as, as important diseases to have vaccines for, that then the donor community would commit to basically buying a certain hundred mil, you know, several hundred millions of, of doses at a given price. Okay. So because now what's happened is you've essentially taken the magic of the market and directed that energy towards the bottom of the pyramid by putting purchasing power behind the needs of that segment of the population and not just relying on the government execution to be able to solve that problem. Okay. So in fact, uh, Talking about the broader challenges of service delivery, you know, Mani Sabarwal has this lovely quote, right, where he says, the government has an execution deficit, the private sector has a trust deficit, and civil society has a scale deficit, right? So the government has legitimacy and scale, but cannot execute at scale. The private sector can execute at scale and can also... Mm, you know, um, uh, yeah, it, it can do both scale and execution, but doesn't have the trust because it is seen essentially as profit maximizing. Civil society has both kind of trust and ability to execute, but is constrained in terms of funding and ability to scale. Okay, so the way we're going to really solve our most pressing problems as a country is to then apply our minds to architecting systems whereby we get the dynamism and ability to execute of the private sector and put that behind with intelligent kind of structures behind the needs of kind of, you know, the the large scale of the population who are otherwise not being served by the market. Okay, so I think I'm really excited by the potential of this fund. I think the mm, the potential for technology is uh, massive, both in terms, like I said, of pedagogy, of governance. So, you know, I have, uh, there's another recent study where we talk about mm, where we look at uh, the problem of just administrative data integrity, okay, the extent to which uh, official data inflates student learning. And what we found was, this is a very nice study by my colleague Abhijit Singh on the myth of official measurement. In fact, a study done in partnership with CSF, where all they do is they do some random retesting of kids and essentially do tablet-based testing. And because the tablet-based testing platform has an item bank that you can randomize which question is being asked and the data is uploaded real time, you're also improving government governance. When you have a good ed tech platform that's kind of speaking back to a server, you now have day-to-day -day visibility on exactly how much time a child is spending on something, and you can track that improvement in learning outcomes literally on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> 
If you think about uh, an Amazon or a Google will run like 10,000 plus A-B tests every year to do like micro improvements in how they're serving their customers. And if you could bring a fraction of that same level of research and development and data orientation towards how we solve some of our most pressing large scale social problems, I think we will have a catalytic impact um, towards, towards that. Okay, so I think the, the specific levers of the fund, whether it's kind of getting for profits to adapt their products, for the lower end of the distribution or kind of providing nonprofits with a little bit of resources to improve their product or leveraging Diksha as a platform or just creating a challenge fund, right? So that, you know, so that we have mm, a thousand flowers blooming with the knowledge that when there's good ideas, there's actually strategic philanthropic capital that's coming behind to support those ideas. I think this has the potential to have, you know, enormous impact. And I congratulate everyone like, you know, who's participating in this process and wish you all the very best of luck. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mekin Maheshwari. I used to be the head of engineering at Flipkart and then was the chief people officer at Flipkart. Post which in about 2016, I decided to move to the development sector. And the ride for the last four years has been fun. I'm the founder of Udyam Learning Foundation and the co-founder of the Global Alliance for Mass Entrepreneurship. I also am a volunteer at ACT. I started volunteering at ACT uh, when COVID hit and through last year working with the likes of Shekhar, Mohit, other like-minded folks from the startup ecosystem in what we could do to fight, uh, fight COVID uh, has been a fascinating journey. I learned a lot uh, and it was great to have ambitious, um, high speed and high scale thinking professionals trying to figure and solve uh, a catastrophe that the world faced and that our country faced. And I think it was that experience that's allowed me to want to continue and see if this group of startup enthusiasts, this, the startup ecosystem can come together to solve larger societal problems that India faces. The EdTech Ambition Fund, as part of ACT, is focused on creating real learning outcomes. Uh, unlike just using technology for delivering education, we as a group care deeply about are these interventions really creating learning outcomes? And hence measurement and data are going to be critical to figuring out are we succeeding or not. Education is a massive, massive challenge and to have any hope of success, it's important to focus. We've picked two very large problems. Uh, first, is the challenge of foundational numeracy and literacy, FLN. And the second is the challenge of learners becoming ready for life and work, what we call the school to work transition. The reason we picked the school to work transition as a key problem is just because of the scale of that challenge as well as the urgency of solving it. By the time we get to college, 75% uh, of our youth drop out of education. What education equips our young people with is not something that they are able to use in life and in work. Most industries, most industry bodies talk about and complain about how what students are being prepared for is just not relevant in, in the work world, in industry. To add to this, the challenge that the world is changing more and more rapidly as a result, it's very hard to predict what will work need 10 years from today. So to prepare young people to be successful in a world that's hard to predict, it's important to build foundational abilities and mindsets that are relevant in the real world and not just theoretical. As part of our school to work focus, we hope to fund entrepreneurs who are able to solve the challenges of enabling young people to be better equipped for life and work. For the EdTech Fund, the four archetypes of how we intend to fund and hope to solve the challenges that I just outlined are number one, fund nonprofits that have built technology and enable them to grow and scale that technology which creates and amplifies impact. Number two, there are many for-profit companies and startups that are solving really hard EdTech problems, but they are doing it only for India One. How could we give them projects that enable them to solve the same problems for India 3? 
this could be a company that's built content in English to be able to build content in regional languages, in Hindi, which could reach people which today are not part of their market segments. Number three, use existing platforms and see if we could fund applications that leverage existing platforms to do better. An example of an existing platform that's very widely used is Deeksha. Deeksha has been built by XTEP and today already is in use by all states in the country. Most teacher training that's done by the government is now part of the Deeksha platform. How could we use technology and build applications connected with Deeksha using the Deeksha platform to enable that to scale the impact a lot more? And finally, the fourth and possibly the most important, we intend to use challenge grants to induce entrepreneurs to explore solving these two really, really tough challenges because we truly believe that we've just about started scratching the surface with how these problems can be solved using technology. Hello everyone, this is Ratna Mehta and I lead the Catalyst Fund at the Vadwani Foundation. Speaking of the edtech sector, I do think that this is truly the huge unlockdown for edtech. In the last few years, companies in the edtech sector have seen tailwinds, but the lockdown and the pandemic has given a fillip to the edtech sector and helped it accelerate to the next level. And this is truly representative of the fact that we are seeing increasing dollars being invested in the sector today. So edtech suggests a promise of providing more equitable access to quality education. It, um, it, it's potential to personalize education and personalize learning for, um, for students, taking in point where the starting points are. And also, um, hopefully through that quality, producing equity. So that is potential, but we know to realize that potential, there is a lot of work to do. There's issues of access, there's issues of connectivity, of time, um, time opportunities to use EdTech, and also combined with um, supporting teachers to be able to integrate technology to help make their lives better and raise a parental awareness of how um, EdTech can transform. So here we have more promising, particularly promising evidence of how education technology can support. Um, and, and the rationale for that is there is a systematic buildup of skills, particularly in mathematics, which lends itself to programming um, and it also lends itself to good diagnostics, so the ability to personalize. If I'm not able to answer a particular question in mathematics, the, um, the online system being able to understand what are the prerequisites for it, do I um, have I got them to send me backwards to study it to then go forward, and also if I've mastered particular concepts instead of getting me to repeat it, helping me to go on to further concept. So um, you know there are, there's promising products coming out that are doing that. And in early grade reading, also a lot of evidence on the science of teaching reading, um, the letter um, word, the letter sound recognition, the word recognition, etc. Um, there is there is proven um, efficacy of how edtech can support that. So ensuring that the school system is preparing our students to enter the workforce in a fully equipped way with the skills that are needed, whether it's problem solving, critical thinking, communication, even empathy, resilience, etc. It's important that we sow the seeds when the children are in school. And that's the reason, you know, there's a recent focus on the whole school to work transition. We do think that that's a bridge we need to cross very soon. Otherwise, a lot of our youth may not even be employable in the new world. So, you know, across the board, there are tailwinds from every angle EdTech is right now seeing the sun shining and it's time for the EdTech companies to make hay while that happens. Hi, I'm Aziz Gupta, a co-founder at Rocket Learning, an EdTech social enterprise 
driving foundational learning for low income children through parent school connections rocket learning solution is technology and community enabled behavior change creating the social incentives and behavioral nudges to pull parent communities to engage with children and teachers bharat is changing with tech penetration and impact opportunities are multiplying with that change rocket learning leverages whatsapp and similarly widely available platforms to create digital classroom groups containing a teacher and 10 to 15 parents we send simple videos demonstrating at home learning activities these groups all automatically by tech and ask parents to send back daily responses of themselves doing activities with their children this creates peer effects accountability and habits for these parents in addition we create social media challenges and campaigns influencer role modeling share smart family certification and report cards to ensure high engagement and long term change in mindset for parents hello everyone my name is pranav kothari i work at educational initiatives and i head the large scale education programs team which takes our assessments and mindswack software to government schools across india the problem that we are trying to solve is that uh, the learning levels in indian schools is low we also find that even in homogeneous socio economic settings the learning levels are very heterogeneous so children who are coming from the same background same family same economic strata still have very different learning levels even twins have very different learning styles in all the the teachers that i have met i find that many of them have the intent that each and every child of their classroom succeeds but they physically find it very difficult to cater to this diversity so the problem that we are solving is how do we use technology to enable teachers to achieve their intent um uh, and actually have every child sort of achieve their full potential so convigenius started with this whole vision of you know bringing the power to teach and learn on the mobile device so uh, we strongly believed in the hypothesis of personalized and adaptive learning and tailoring the instructions to the right teaching and learning levels so we uh, we believe that teacher is an integral part of the solution and we need to use technology and integrate it uh in the whole teaching learning transaction so we tried to solve the problem from both sides right from the beginning and there uh we saw the role of data and, uh, and uh, science of learning as a key part and uh, cg started working right from 2014 to kind of go deeper into how children learn and assessments kind of became the backbone for that in terms of understanding uh, we imagined the solution to work like a gps map if you were to identify the current location of the child which is your point a uh, in for any subject or competency and we know where they need to be based on a grade level competency or uh, whatever they are aiming for say iit foundation so we know a destination which is point b so uh, edtech is was essentially how do we solve the journey from point a to point b right uh, finding the shortest learning journey shortest and best possible optimal path Hi this is Nishant Patni I'm the founder uh, of this platform called Hello English which allows people from 23 vernacular languages to learn basic conversational english that can help them uh, get ahead in terms of employability make them more confident in their social lives and also help their kids do better at school Now Hello English brings this power of personalized and effective english learning to the hands of millions of learners uh We have two products, Hello English and Hello English Kids. Both use uh, gamification, advanced voice, and AI technologies to deliver powerful learning experiences, which are localized to speakers of 23 vernacular languages. So you can learn English from Hindi, Punjabi, Tamil, Malayalam, Telugu, or even Chinese, Arabic, and so on. Hi, uh, my name is Nina, and I'm the co-founder of an app called Utter. Utter is a pl- platform that we've built uh, to assist. essentially allow learners uh, who are typically graduates uh, to express themselves in the internet economy and we believe that you know there are many research reports which say that 94% of the graduates are unable to speak fluently but the challenge uh, that we see is uh, english as a component of expressing yourself in a context of getting a job Uh, is something uh, you know that is the biggest challenge these youth are facing today so they they spend about 1000 1500 hours uh, you know in learning uh, you know technical skills or you know uh, commerce grads or science grads scientific skills 
but they don't uh, prepare themselves uh, to express this 15 hours 1500 hours of learning that they have done uh, in a 15 to 20 minute interview uh, the biggest demand is for uh, speaking and what we've done is we build a conversational app uh, which is a combination of uh, conversational chatbots and live tutors who also converse with the learners all the time so once you come onto utter app you are actually entering a conversational ecosystem and in terms of what we plan for the future while this has won the hearts of 50 million people but and it's really humbling for us but 50 million is just the tip of the iceberg right we're looking at a problem which is much more uh, massive as i said over a billion people out there are in search of such solutions so for us this is just the start and that's exactly the size of uh, the impact that we want to reach my hope and plan for the future is that all children are learning with understanding the indian education system has this ratta mar ke sikho aur jyada marks karo uh, where it emphasizes memorizing you know facts figures procedures far more than truly understanding concepts so i think that if every child actually learns with understanding they would be prepared for any exam in life a dream is to create a national social movement in the next 5 years in which 5 crore parents build the habit to engage with their child's learning both at home and at school we want to create a future in which no child loses their future by the age of 8